We're so glad that you've joined us. This is our uh, Kabbalah class, User's Guide for the Soul. And we are starting a new uh, section today. So if you're one of the people that has always thought, I wonder if I'd like this class, this User's Guide for the Soul, today is a perfect day for you to start because we're going to start a topic that's uh, new information for everybody. So uh, please stay and, and uh, join. And if you want to be one of the people that's on our Zoom call, just email uh, Maya at Temple israel.org and she will send you the link as well as the class text which is the Tanya this edition by the Alta Rebbe uh, Schneer Zalman of Liadi so we've gone through uh, kind of a, a whole section on how physical action is actually the key to the mystical side of Judaism because a physical mitzvah in the physical world the lowest place creates a home for God and that's why God created the world so that's that's you want to get to the most spiritual moment you can have in a day. It's shaking a lulav. It's putting tzedakah in a tzedakah box. You just have to understand the frame of reference to see the mysticism in it. Then we said there's something else called kavana, however, which is love and awe, which is what we use to elevate that mitzvah so it fills with light. It's a home filled with light. Now, this is one of my favorite sections of the Tanya for the next uh, nine chapters. The Alter Rebbe is going to give us detailed meditations on how to supercharge both your love, the flow of love, which is chesed, Kabbalistically, and your flow of awe, which is gevura. And these are some of the most beautiful, beautiful meditations that I found, not just in Judaism, but when I was doing uh, Zen meditation and karate or yoga. This, this stuff is, it's, it's, it's the most inspiring stuff I think there is that humanity has. It's amazing. So I'm excited to take you through all these meditations that will teach us how to very quickly and easily supercharge and have tremendous love of the Ain Sof and awe of the Ain Sof with which to elevate all the things that we are doing. Before we begin, however, I want to talk about this idea of Kavana and the emotions. Because until now, if you've been with us, we've been talking about Kavana, meaning both love and awe together, and we're going to define them, both love and awe together when they're focused on doing a mitzvah, when they're focused on doing something. Now the Alter Rebbe is going to say, okay, let's, let's stop, let's take them apart, let's look at love, let's look at awe, let's see how they work together as these two wings, and then let's give you tools to deepen and elevate both your love and your awe. And the Alter Rebbe is going to start by saying of love and of awe, and I'll use the Hebrew words, ahava and yira. So you want to get those words very familiar, ahava meaning love, and yira is very hard to define. Sometimes we call it awe, we might call it respect. You're going to see in the text it's translated as fear, but fear is not my favorite word to use for it because it's not really fear as you think of it. So I'm going to use the word yira for the most part, and I'd like you to find your favorite word and, and replace that in your mind when I say the word yira, whatever works best for you. But Does of the fit, two... Walter, is amazement, does that fit? Yeah, yeah, I think amazement. If I, if, I walk, if I walk outside to the Grand Canyon uh, the first day I'm there and I look out at that, that massive creation and I'm just full of amazement and I, and I feel small and I'm gone and, and creation is so wonderful that I'm, I'm full of amazement, that's exactly a beautiful definition, 100%. So let's add that to our lists. And welcome, Linda, who's joining our class. Welcome, Linda. Now, Thank you. one one piece I want to be clear about about uh, f about uh, Yira. And hi, Linda. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you. And it, Linda, you'll read if you're comfortable after Paula. You'll let us know when we get there if you have the text. When we say Yira, and we say awe, or if, if we're using the word fear, perhaps. I want to be clear that what we're not talking about is fear of punishment. We're not talking about fear of punishment, like I'm a child and oh no, if I take a cookie without permission, mom's going to you know, not give me dessert for three days. Oh, poor me. Nowhere in the Tanya does it talk about we should be afraid of punishment. <laughs> he doesn't even really talk about consequences so much, right? So we're talking about if I love something, if I love uh, my children, if I love uh, my wife, if I love nature, then naturally I have 
reticence to be disconnected from it. I'm concerned about anything that would disconnect me from that. If I love nature, and I see that that uh, you know the place I'm in wants to raise an entire an entire uh, wild wild uh, an entire natural res- preserve, I have I have I have fear. I have concern that now I'll be disconnected from nature, which I love, and that nature won't be there. If I if I love my children, I'm very careful when I have a young child to say, "Don't go on the road. You're too young to understand how to cross the road safely." And I really have fear. I won't lie to you. I have fear that something will, might happen, God forbid, to my child, and I'll be disconnected. They'll be disconnected from life. When you love something, you have fear of being disconnected from it, and that's the only thing we're talking about, that and above. So when we say awe, amazement, whatever it is, when I use the word yira, please understand, we're not talking about fear of punishment. We're talking about, at the very least, fear of disconnection from the Ain Sof in this case, from the infinite in this case. And then we're going to have levels, because in these nine chapters, you'll discover the many, many levels of love and awe, of Ahava and Yira, that these meditations can lead to. It's a very sophisticated approach to uh, spiritual emotions, let's call them. But that is, that is the lowest level. And it's, if you understand, humans have a natural capacity for this Yira. Like, if I were to say, let, you know, random person step out on a stage in front of 10,000 people, and give a speech, or sing a song, or do a dance, whatever you might do, suddenly, you have a feeling of, oh, I'm worried, I don't want to get it wrong, I'm concerned. I have sort of an embarrassment, perhaps. That's an even higher level of this era, because when we're in front of something that's great, when we're in front of something that we know is uh, above us, like the Grand Canyon in some ways, like the Ain Sof, of course, or like a great person, or a collection of many people that's great, we naturally feel something called Yura, and I think we can all relate to that. And we want to be able to meditate to inspire that when we're relating to the Ain Sof. It's as simple as that. So if we want to supercharge love and awe, I think in North America, we really uh, understand love quite well, because love has been really, really, uh, it's got a good marketing campaign going on. You know, turn to uh, things like uh, the Beatles, and very famously, all you need is love. There's nothing but love. And then also, we're in a wider, uh, a wider religion, Christianity, that teaches that God is defined by love. Whereas in Judaism, you'd say, "Hold on, <laughs> how can you say God is love? That's so limited, right?" But that, that's that's a message we've really gotten that love is everything. Love is all you need. God's defined by love. Whereas Yura, that uh, has taken kind of a backseat. You feel like you're immature if you're relying on Yura. Right? So I want to replace this idea of this, this, uh, this kind of scared of punishment yura with this idea of awe, or perhaps respect, reverence, I think amazement was brought up. So let's start with this conversation about yura, about, about uh, awe. And let's put it in the context of a relationship, which is our relationship with, with God. Right? But let's, let's talk about a human relationship. The Alter Rebbe is going to start by saying, of the two, of love and awe, it's not love that we need first, although one is not more important than the other. But in fact, it's yira, it's awe or amazement that we need first because it is foundational. It's foundational. So it's not that one is more important than the other, but if you don't have the Yira first, the Alter Rebbe is saying, and Alex, hold on, I want to finish this point. If you don't have the Yira first, if you don't have the Yira first, then the Alter Rebbe is going to say, actually, the love is going to be lacking something. Whereas once you have the Yira, now you can have both, and one is just as important as the other. And uh, this teacher, Shays Taub, expresses it like this. He says, imagine I came home to my wife, uh, for dinner. We had planned to have dinner. She made it cooked a beautiful dinner. But there was one problem. I was three hours late, and I hadn't called or let her know. So I come home to my wife three hours late. I want to I see everybody's faces as, I, as I'm telling this uh, mushal. But there's something else I have. I'm a very romantic guy. I love my wife. I know she loves yellow roses. It's, it's the most beautiful color and the most beautiful flower. And I went out on my lunch break, 
and I got her a dozen yellow roses, and I'm so happy to come home and present her with these yellow roses because I love her, right? But I've also come home three hours late without letting her know, and, and dinner is now cold on the table. So let me ask you, and I'm, I'll start a conversation. Is she going to appreciate my loving gesture of bringing her those 12 roses? I got some big no's, right? Everybody agrees, no. No need. Yes, Noreen? She will it's a start. It's just start. She'll be laughing. She'll be laughing, right? She'll be, She'll yeah. be laughing. Like, you, like, here you are, you schmuck. You love me. You brought me these roses. You're three hours late. My dinner screwed up. It's will all be mixed up together. Right. So it's all, it's all kind of lost. And the loving gesture, that love is not really flowing. And it certainly is not landing and being received. Because what is respect? It's making myself small to make room for her. See, I know I was busy and I was delayed and I was this, but I couldn't even take time to call and let her know. I couldn't make room for her in that reality to say, honey, I'm really sorry. I'm going to be another hour late. Can you please, you know, put dinner away? And, and I, I'm, I apologize. If I don't have that respect, if I haven't made myself small and taken myself out of the way to leave room for her, now that gesture of love, it's clear to all of us that it's lost. It's lost. That's what the Alter Rebbe is getting at when he says respect is foundational. He says we actually need to get a base level of respect flowing with our relationship with the Ain Self, and we'll talk about what that is when we start the chapter. If then we want to have our love flow and really land and be received. Because if not, if I haven't started by leaving room for the Ain Self with a basic level of respect, now my love is not love either. Right? So the, the awe is foundational. Alex, what's your question? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm curious about the relationship in Hebrew of um, uh, yira to, um, to, to, to the, the verb for see, like the, 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 the like ro, ro, roe. Yeah, yeah. The, the third person singular masculine imperfect form of ra'a. So I think I think linguistically the roots are different, but it may be that there's some chasidus on that where people play with it because you're certainly allowed to, you know, you, when you're dealing with letters, it's not like strict rules. If you're doing something beautiful, you're kind of allowed. I haven't read any chasidus on that, so I can't speak to it. But if there is some, I, I think it'd be beautiful. I think that's it's a lovely insight. Um, but in fact, there there is another. Uh, you remind me of another another word piece with Yira, which is actually Yerushalayim, right? The city Yerushalayim is called the city of peace. That's that's kind of its its known translation. But there's another translation which is Yira Shalem, and there it really it really uh, is is those two those two words put together. So the city of Jerusalem, the center of Judaism, the heart of Judaism in the world, its name is Yira Shalem or complete fear. Total fear. Sorry, total total amazement, total awe. So there's something about this idea of Yira, of awe, that is so foundational that that's, you go to the Kotel, that's the name of the city you're standing in. It's something so key about our spiritual path. Uh, and before we go into, the, okay, any any thoughts? Because that, that's kind of my uh, my pitch for Yira. Any, any thoughts from, from the class? Yeah, Rick. Oh, uh, you're saying, let's back up a second. You cannot have love without Yura. Correct. That's what the Alter Rebbe is about to say. That's what it, that's what I agree. Saying. I okay. agree. And for that reason, right? Same but way you if... Have, but you can have Yura without love. Well, you don't want Yura without love, because Yura without love is, is dry and mechanical, right. so you don't want that either. But yes, but you can start the, with Yura, and it will be two, Yura. But these yeah. are the two wings that lift up the mitzvahs, correct? Correct. Ultimately, you want both. Yeah. So why are they separate? Well, until now, they haven't, right? So it's a good question. Until now, we talked about it as kavana, meaning together. But the reason we're separating now is because you need a different meditation for love than you need for amazement. So now, in this section, where he's going deeper into, if you've been with us, I don't want to get into technical, but the long, short path, which we learned in chapters 16 and 17, we learned it quite quickly and then moved on to the short, long path. And now he's coming back to give us the, you know, the meat, the juice, of how we dive in and really create more powerful Ahava and more powerful Yura. So to do that, we need to separate them, separate them. Okay. to examine each. I'm just curious about how you guys are taking this uh, this introduction to Yura. Noreen? 
Well, I just, I, along with what Alex was saying too, <clears throat> there's a very close relationship because in the Akeda story, he sees, he understands, he's amazed by, it's a very, very close relationship uh, between seeing and the, you know, having the vision, meaning the perception, the understanding and the respect. Good, good. So that may be, may be a, a very fertile very connection there. Very good. nice. So I want to I wanna address one point because we're a reform temple and uh, people watching and welcome everybody. You're welcome to join us uh, on our Zoom class. Just email Maya at temple-israel.org, as I said. She'll give you the link. Uh, and of course, I'm going to now, for, for I have some friends that watch this that are in the more traditional community and even, even teachers of mine that look at this uh, that sometimes pop in. So I'll just give you a warning. For the next five, ten minutes or so, I'm going to leave the Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, trigger warning, you may want to just, you know, pause and fast forward 10 minutes for the conversation I'm about to have. This is not a Tanya conversation. But as a Reform synagogue, and this is not at all, as I said, what, what the Alter Rebbe teaches and what he says, but I'm, I'd like to address our question, which is, if we're talking about Yira, which means respect, which in the traditional community means, if it says so in the Torah, that's what I have to do. That's, that's how they define respect. And we, of course, say we're not halakhically bound. We're not halakhically bound as a movement. So if something really doesn't work for me, it's my personal choice whether to engage in it or not. If something really makes no sense, it's my personal choice to change it so it does make sense. That's, that's the reform practice. It seems to me like if that's our practice, now this year a thing becomes a little further away. Because it begs the question, well, if I get to decide... If I can say yes or no, if I can say, well, not like this, but like this, then maybe Yura is not important. Maybe all I need is Ahava, love, because really it's me making the decision. I'm in charge. And so what's, you know, what am I afraid of? I can just say no. There's nothing to be afraid of. And perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps there's not really, not really a place for Yura in a reform spiritual practice based on that. So I'd like to put out the suggestion that even, I mean, I know normally I just focus on the positive. I say, let's not, let's not debate this stuff. I know some people like to do this and that. We're Reformed Jews. We can make our choices. And this is here for the mitzvahs you do. And I want you to do them in the best possible way. And let's leave it at that. That's usually my approach. Focus on the positive. But today I want to touch on that question because I believe that even as Reformed Jews who are not halakhically bound, we can still make those choices, those decisions, better if we do have yura, awe, flowing, or respect, let's call it, flowing. I think we can be better Reformed Jews and make our Reformed choices better when we've mastered yura and we have a powerful sense of yura flowing. And this is why. If I, if I need to make a decision about something that's very important to me and I really have respect for it, like, uh, say, uh, you know, is my daughter is my daughter ready to drive? That's an important decision to me. A lot riding on it, right? I'm gonna know everything about it. I'm gonna make sure she knows everything about it. Right? I'm not gonna leave any. I'm not gonna say, well, I, it doesn't matter if she knows the rules of the road. It doesn't matter if she knows, you know, how to handle the car and she's been trained. It doesn't. Not, you know, it's not important. I'm just gonna make the decision without without me or her knowing. God forbid, right? This is driving a car. This is serious stuff. I've got deep respect for what can happen if you don't drive a car properly, you don't know. So I'm going to learn everything. She has to take lessons. She has to pass the test. She has to pass the written and the driving test. When something's important, you make sure you know about it. And that's the first step of making a decision is knowing. As a Reformed Jew, how can I decide whether or not I'm going to engage in something if I don't know what the mitzvahs are and how you do them from different perspectives? That I need to know. So I believe if we have a deep sense of Yura as Reformed Jews, A, we're going to learn more. We're going to learn as much as Noreen knows in class, or Alex, who pointed out a uh, beautiful spelling uh, uh, of Yura and Lirot that are connected, right? The more I know, the better decision I make, the better Reformed I am. And Yura causes me to make sure that I know. That's step one. Then step two is, let's call it being rigorous. Let's call it being rigorous. Right? Everything that I do that's important, 
you have to do it with a certain level of commitment and you have to work on yourself and you have to really uh, have a hunger to do it, right? You want to really go for it. And the same thing with these decisions. If I'm looking at, uh, you know, so there, there's, there's, a, there's a part of Yom Kippur, let's say, as an example, is to wear non-leather shoes, right? Non-leather shoes. It's pretty easy to have a pair of, of nice slippers that you put on and then nothing else you have to do. You, you observe that mitzvah. I don't know that it really, you really give up anything or that it's a huge ordeal for anybody. It seems easy enough if you know about it, right? And so... As a Reformed Jew, if I'm looking at that, and I just say, eh, you know, maybe not. Why is the reason I haven't done it? Is it a compelling moral reason as a Reformed Jew? Where I say, no, I really believe in wearing leather shoes, <laughs> right? I really, I really uh, you know, that, that that's so important to me. I, I just can't part with my whatever it is. Or it's just, I said, you know, I, I can't, I don't want to say I can't be bothered, or I don't have time, or I don't have energy. But if I don't have Yura, I risk making decisions just because, you know what, I don't really have the energy to work on myself. I'm not really taking this with the depth that I would take an important problem. Whereas when I do have Yura, now I'm going to be willing to do the work. I'm going to say, you know what, as a Reformed Jew, I'm going to give the Torah and Halakha a vote. And I really, if I'm not going to do it, I need a good reason that, you know, I, I, my morals are such that I just can't, I can't abide by that. Okay, right? I get that. Or, uh, you know, really, I, I need to go see my parent on, on Shabbat. It's, it means so much to them. I can't do it without driving. Uh, okay, I get it. But really, if it's just, you know, I, it takes too much time, not that, you know, I don't feel like it, that's where Yira comes in and says, well, hold on. Are you taking this seriously? Are you making both an informed decision and are you doing it for a good personal reason? That, that even if I even I'm standing before the Ein Sof, and I'm filled with awe, I can still say, you know what? This is how I saw the world. I believe that fill in the blank. And if I got it wrong, I'm sorry, but I, I genuinely felt that way. And I, I can defend my decision. That's That to me is a choice made with Yura. And then the third one, uh, we don't like to talk about this a whole lot, but I think it affects all of us, uh, is, is, is peer pressure, right? As Reformed Jews, we like to say that everyone makes their own decision. Everyone makes their own choice. But like every society, we all want to fit in, and everyone around us wants us to fit in too, that we're normal social animals like that. And if I'm looking at that choice about wearing, you know, the funny-looking black slipper instead of the elegant uh, leather shoe, and I'm saying, you know what, I know about it. Second, I don't see any moral reason why I shouldn't do it. But you know what, my friends are going to look at me funny, or, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really in style. Do I really feel like showing myself like that? whatever the reasons are, if I'm more afraid of how people are going to look at me, perhaps, or what the peer pressure is, then again, if I had that yura of the Ein Sof, then maybe I wouldn't be so affected by peer pressure. Which I could tell you, personally, when I started wearing a kippah, you know, social circles, etc., people really do respond, and, and not everybody responds comfortably, and you got to put them at ease. But uh, I, I know how it feels to feel like Wow, I'm really, uh, I'm really facing some social pressure, and I've got a resistance to that inside. And uh, what is that about? And is that why I want to make decisions? And I think, I think that's real. So those are my three reasons why I think Reformed Jews, who are not halakhically bound, would also really benefit from these chapters because we're going to learn how to supercharge our yira for the insuf, and that means I'm going to learn here at Temple Israel about Judaism. I'm going to work on myself with real diligence out of a sense of respect and awe. And finally, I'm going to keep peer pressure in its place. And if something's right for me as a Reformed Jew, we're not conformed Jews, we're Reformed Jews. So I should do what's right for me and not be overly driven by a peer pressure around me. Thoughts on that? Maybe I should have skipped it. Looks like from your faces I, should, I could have skipped that whole thing. <laughs> Maybe we'll cut it out of the video when he posts it on YouTube. Yeah, you'll let me know. Yes, Sharon. Cool. Well, um, I think it's it's very valid that you're bringing it up when you're saying it, because I think there, um, I think just in our human nature, just the way, at least the way I am, if if you tell me I have to do something, I just kind of do this, 
and 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 in our and in Reform Judaism, as in and many other places, at this time and this point in in my in my life in this country in our lives, it's very important that uh, in the peer pressure way and also the real way that we assert ourselves and that we we don't do things just because we're told we should we should. So I think what you're doing here is showing the benefit to giving full reflection before you decide you don't want to do it. Yeah, I love your point. I think it's true that there's an advantage to doing something because I want to. And we all have that little like who says when someone tells me to do something. That one. But that we're one. gonna get we're gonna get back to exactly that. But because it's got the alter so you know, it's not such a I mean, we could all I think everyone here, I'm sure, has a huge respect for God. And yeah. and and doesn't need it's just these words that get in the way. Yeah, yeah. But we'll actually get back to exactly exactly that point maybe today. Uh and I, it also in fact will show, I hope you'll see, uh, that there's an advantage to doing something because I love doing it. But there's also an advantage of doing something because someone said so, and I'm like, "What? I got to get out of the way for that." So let, I'll see see how that lands, and you get to it. But let's dive in. So we're on page 598, and welcome back, <laughs> welcome back, anybody who had to skip that section. We're now we're now back in the Tanya, and uh, now everything else we're we're uh, reading is from the Alter Rebbe, and not my own uh, progressive chiddush there. Michael, I really liked your explanation about peer pressure. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, I know I get it all the time when I tell somebody I'm studying Tanya. It's as simple as that. They say, oh, you're, you're, you're no longer reformed. Now you're whatever title they want to give me. So I know all about the peer pressure. Right, yeah, it's real, real. And and our reform uh, philosophy is we don't tell each other what to do, right? I, I don't tell someone else they have to learn this or have to learn that or should or shouldn't and 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 they don't tell me and and that's the reform practice so but yet it exists so uh, you know here we are in a reform synagogue learning tanya because we, we we you know it's our choice one must however constantly bear in mind that is the beginning of divine service as well as its core and root so the Torah begins by saying, if you want to serve God, right, which is the spiritual practice, which is prayer, which is uh, refining yourself, if you want to genuinely do that, the beginning of that service, its core and its root, so this is not the most important piece, right? It's not that, it's not that love is not also as important, and we don't, want to, we don't lack love, but the beginning of the service, its root, where it comes from, this means, although fear is the root of turn away from evil, and love is the root of do good. So classically, and in chapter 4, uh, the author Rebbe pointed out, basically the simple idea is, I have love and I have awe, and I use the love to do the positive commandments. So when I, when I want to uh, get up and pray, or when I want to give tzedakah, or when I want to, I want to read from the Torah, I say, I'm going to engage my love. I love Judaism. I love God. I'm going to do it with enthusiasm. I'm going to dance around with the tzedakah box. And that's how I do the positive commandments. And then the negative commandments, right? Don't lie. Don't gossip. Right? Never get angry, right? The negative commandments, or, you know, follow your kashrut. Don't eat this and that, whatever, whatever's on your plate and whatever's off your plate personally, right? The negative commandments, there I need my sense of awe because, look, someone's going to at a restaurant say, would you like the fill-in-the-blank burger? And it looks good, and my friend next to me maybe is eating it, and I got to say no. And for that, I need gvura, right? I need, I, need, I need awe, I need fear. And I use that for the negative commandments so that I don't lie, so I don't gossip, so I don't get angry, so I don't eat things I'm, I'm, I'm intending not to eat etc. And that's the basic, is that love is for the positive commandments, and awe is for the negative commandments. But the Alter Rebbe is going to say, in fact, that's a very simplistic uh, approach. And in fact, if I really want to serve God, I need to have a sense of respect and, and, and amazement for all the commandments, not just the negative ones. Let's go into it. Nevertheless, it is not sufficient to awaken the love alone to do good. 
right? So to do the positive mitzvahs, and that's all of them, that's the relational mitzvahs of loving another Jew, right? That's the, uh, that's the, uh, 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 that's the spiritual mitzvahs uh, uh, of loving God, of not, of, of uh, you know, you fill in the blank. If I do them with just love, as we said, it's actually I haven't started serving God. There's something missing from that love. And I need to have a baseline of yira also flowing, even for the positive mitzvahs. But at the very least, before performing the positive command, <clears throat> one must first arouse the innate fear or respect which lies hidden in the heart of every Jew, not to rebel against the Supreme King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be he, as has seen as has been stated above. I like that, Dan. As we go through these chapters, feel free to, you know, it is an English translation, so that's not that's not the Tanya. The Alter Rebbe wrote it in, in Hebrew. So f- feel free to replace the word fear with your favorite translation of Yura. I think that'll be a nice, a nice. Uh, you start a nice tradition there, Dan, that I love. <laughs> but at the very least, and this actually is, it's a very special section of the Tanya, because the, the last Rebbe, of this system. So Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Chabad Rebbe, who is the seventh uh, uh, Rebbe after the Alter Rebbe who wrote this text, actually asked many individuals to memorize the this first section of chapter 41 because we're supposed to go through this meditation. The technique that we're learning here is that I go through this meditation before I do any mitzvah, positive or negative. And primarily in the morning, as you'll see, I, I really supercharge my awe in the morning, and then I can touch on it quickly before I do a mitzvah. So it's not like someone asks me for money, and I say, uh, hold on, hold on, i got to meditate for 10 minutes. Now I can give you the money. <laughs> you know? But just breathing in, coming back to the meditation, holding it in my mind, touching the state I achieved in the morning so that I infuse the mitzvah with both love and yura, I meant to do that throughout the day, and I want to come back to this meditation. So this really is... A very active meditation. I'll say I've memorized it, and uh, and uh, if if you're going to get the benefits of these chapters, uh, I would approach it as an actual practice that we're going to add to our long short path. And you notice he says it's not it's not arousing the fear that the King of Kings, the Holy One, is going to punish you for doing something wrong. <laughs> right? It's not that. It's not fear of punishment. It is awe of the in the ain't sof. and if I'm in awe of someone, I'm not going to rebel against them, right? If if I'm in the room with uh, my my very favorite pop artist, you know, say Phil Collins is here. I love Phil Collins, right? And and Phil's like, yeah, hey, I heard you're a singer. You know, maybe you want to sing, uh, you know, one of your fa- my favorite songs. Like, would I want to sing a song get a lyric wrong? But I mean, I'm, is he going to punish me for doing that? No, but my, I mean, I'm in, I'm in so in such an awe of him, I barely want to sing his song. Like, you sing your song. I, I'm going to make myself small. Same thing here. It's not fear of punishment. It's f- fear, it's awe and, and, and uh, respect that, w- that we would never rebel against the King of Kings because that's going to separate us. I'm never going to, I'm never going to, I'm never going to do something that, 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 that my wife doesn't like because she's going to be upset with me. It'll be a separation. And same thing with the Ain Self. This awe we have has nothing to do with me getting punished and my self interest. It's everything to do with how in all I am of the Ein Sof, and how I'd never want to do anything to separate and cause a gap. Uh, let's go on with Sharon, if you can. So that this, so that this awe should manifest itself in his heart, or at least in his mind. And as he'll go on to say, we don't, we don't need to have an awe where we're literally trembling or standing in amazement before I can go and do a mitzvah. As we've learned in many past meditations, look, some people are like that. Some people are so spiritual that they think of, of how God is surrounding and filling the world, and suddenly they are filled with trembling awe, and, you know, they do their thing. But there are some people for whom they'll meditate on this, and I'll picture some of the meditations we're going to learn, and you know what? I'm not trembling in awe. I just have an idea in my mind that, wow, yeah, I really should have respect for this Ain Self business who's creating the world and me and etc. And 
I understand the fear or the awe in my mind, and I'm holding it in my mind, and it's going to motivate me to do stuff. But you know what? Call me, call me whatever. I'm not trembling in awe. My heart doesn't really respond that way. The altar Rebbe says, that's perfectly fine, because fear that I have in my mind is, in fact, still fear. And as we'll learn, there's even an advantage to having fear in my mind and not in my heart, because when it's in my heart, I kind of enjoy, oh, look at me, I'm so spiritual. I have fear of, uh, of, of the Ain Sof, and here I am doing my mitzvahs with fear. There's a little, there can still be a little bit of a, you know, a, a pleasure in that, whereas if it's in my mind, I don't even get that pleasure. I'm still doing it just as a, as a servant, as we'll see. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Cantor, is this mindfulness? It is. It involves mindfulness. Mm -hmm. But mindfulness uh, is a more general term for, for awareness, for the flow of dot. And, but mindfulness of what, right? So it's mindfulness, but then, then putting the divine concept in front of that mindfulness that the meditation we're going to learn, that, that the Ain Sof is, is so great that I should have awe for the Ain Sof and for the mitzvahs that I'm doing. So you can be mindful of, of many things, and here we want to be mindful of the awe relationship that I'm having with the Ain Sof. And so here's where the meditation proper begins. And in fact, as he'll say, in the morning, before you put on your uh, your talus, if you are a talus in, in your morning practice, you can actually say this meditation out loud. You can hold it in your mind for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, what you have time for, so that the mitzvahs that you do are now infused with this foundational level of yira, and you've got those two wings ready to start elevating your mitzvahs. Dehainu litponen b'machashavto al kol panim gdulan insof baruchu malchuto. Paula, why don't you go ahead if you can unmute for me? And we're right at the top of 599. This means that in order to arouse within himself the latter category of fear, he should at least contemplate in his mind the greatness of the blessed Einsof and his kingship. All right, so to arouse this basic level of fear, there's going to be higher levels of fear we'll work on, but I want to contemplate in my mind, and here the word is lehit bonen, so for anyone new, uh, to our class, hit bonanut, that is the the technical term for Jewish meditation. So if you're looking for a text that is a meditative text, that is overt, it's right here in front of you. I know a lot of people think, well, that that's not Judaism. This is a text on meditation, and the term is hit bonanut, which is the bina side, the, the conscious, intellectual, analytical side, exploring a, a contemplative image to the extent that it fills the mind completely, and then causes uh, spiritual connections and awareness in the form of spiritual emotions related to the Ein Sof. That's hit bonanut as we're, as we're learning it. So I want to contemplate in my mind how great the Ein Sof is and how Malchuto, the Ein Sof, really is creating and running the world in terms of divine providence, in terms of right and wrong. Who says that killing someone is wrong? I could argue that killing someone, you can't prove to me that it's wrong. Right? I don't want to go through that exercise. We've done it. But ultimately, who says it's wrong? The Ain Sof says it's wrong. <laughs> right? I mean, there are societies where cannibalism was part of their culture. Tell them that it's wrong. They say, you can't prove it to me. I mean, that's that's how my dad, my mom raised me. And, uh, you know, these people can't protect themselves. Then they get eaten. That's that's right and wrong, right? So in, in Judaism, we have a very absolutist view of right and wrong. And it does not come from debates. It comes from the Ain Sof. And the Ain Sof establishes that because the Ainsof has created the world. I know that's a bit of a challenge to some contemporary people, but probably not for most seekers. And certainly if I fill my mind with that image, now you see I'm heading towards a sense of awe, a sense of respect. Which extends. Uh, Linda, do you want to read with us? Uh, I can't. My screen is cracked. I can't see it all. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, let's let's go back to to Rick or Alex. You you're gonna read? Oh no, I have a que I have a, I have a, I have a question regarding, you know, these these kinds of fears, um, particularly at this, because fear also like you know if you you're afraid of something you know there is a, you know, you you might respect it but you might also try to avoid it, and you might also resent it, um, and and so how. 
how do you tweak your 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 fear so as to not to because we're obviously not trying to avoid the end soft we're not trying to um resent it um how how i mean if, i mean on the other hand it, it does i mean i i can see why it's related to the negative commandments like don't do this and so there, there are certain things that we should avoid and I'm, I'm just wondering how that how that all how that all works i mean how like i know that it's saying that we should have this fear but you know how do we make sure that it doesn't you know like oh, I, I don't want to deal with this this is this is, this is overwhelming yeah, a very good question. It gets to the heart of, of I think, the conversation uh, and the heart of, you know, am I fearing consequences or am I fearing separation because I love the entity, right? So in the world, you know, if I've ever had a bear come into my campsite and take a swat at somebody, I'm going to avoid the bear, right? <laughs> I see next bear, I'm going to I'm gonna head the other direction, right? Because I know the bear could, could, could harm me and I'm, I have a fear of the consequences, a fear of, of what's going to happen. Or if I have a boss that that's mean and doesn't treat me well, but you know what? If I don't do what they say, they're gonna not pay me, and and, and so I might resent it. But it's gonna it's gonna get me to do the thing out of a sense of resentment. That's not what we want either, right? So we have to distinguish between era of punishment or consequences, which is not what we're talking about, and that I think I agree would lead to resentment, avoidance, etc., versus era of I don't want to be separated from this thing that I love, right? I, I love my children. I would never do something that might cause us to be separated. I don't, I don't want to say something that will cause them to resent me in the long term. I, I don't want to put them in a place where they're, they're in danger, God forbid, and they'd be in a hospital. I wouldn't be able to uh, connect with them or, or even worse, right? So it's that second type of era we're talking about where it's all about that I have a love of something. And so now I've got to approach that being with a sense of Yura if that love is going to flow and connect. But it's not, oh, oh, you know, God's going to, I'm going to get stripes for this or, or I'm going to have an extra week in Gehenna. Like that's, that's not what we're about. That's just self-centeredness, right? That's just my, my animal soul again saying, well, what about me, right? So that's not, that's not what we're aiming at. So you can't, like, you know, the Ainsoff is like a bear you can't get away from. You can't get away. You're not, get, you're not getting away. You know, and, and particularly as 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 uh, as a uh, everyone sees Lisa kind of doing some sweeping in the background. Sorry, um, you know the uh, you know as as a particularly as a Jew, like we there like I don't know if we can get away from our 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 relationship to Hashem whether we whether if we wanted to or not. And so I mean I think it's it's not just I mean I, I think it's I, I think it's you know not just. Uh, about love but you know just an acknowledgement of like the pervasiveness of this of this connection that we have you know this in inevitable um awesome but you know inevitable um you know destined connection that we have with hashem does, does that make yeah i mean i hear your point i think we're, go we're going a little further afield um but obviously you're right we can't disconnect from the infinite because the infinite's everything but from our perspective, we, we can consciously have a stronger conscious connection or a less conscious connection. And that's what we mean when we say cutting one off is that is that there's a barrier to my soul being able to consciously receive that light or even super consciously uh, be able to receive that light from its perspective. So that that's what we're talking about. But, you know, it's, it's really the main point is we don't we aren't interested in the fear of the bear kind of fear. That That's that's just. That's just the the animal soul. That's just self centered fear. We are interested in the kind of awe where I just I'm in such I'm in such awe of something that that I want I want to make sure my connection is great with that with that being. <clears throat> so that's not a bear. I don't I don't feel that way with a bear. <laughs> uh, where what page? Where in the page? It extends. I share him malchut kolamim elinim v'tachtonim, and I think we're back at uh, Rick which extends to all worlds, both higher and lower, bearing in mind that the greater the king's dominion, the more awe it inspires in his subjects. All right, so in this, in this meditation, we have a, a ruler that is ruling the entire world and also all the spiritual worlds, every angel we've heard about, you know, Matat that we learned about, God's, God, God is complete ruler of all that. Vihu memole kolamin. 
and let him further consider that he fills all worlds, animating them with an indwelling life force that created beings can experience and comprehend. So we've learned about two types of spiritual light. There, there's a, a, a filling light that can relate to creation, that, that somehow is making a hand a hand, and says, okay, that's the light that a hand needs, motion and shape, etc. Visovev kolamin... Go ahead, Eleanor. It encompasses all worlds. That is, he also animates them with a life force that transcends the experience and comprehension of created beings. So there's not just the light that relates to the world. There's also another light that's beyond the world that totally transcends the world that has nothing to do with the world. The world doesn't exist in relationship to it. And 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 that light also uh, is the Ain't Self. So the Ain't Self is not just, not just creating everything that exists, it's also infinitely beyond that in a transcendental mode, transcendent mode. Uh, As Maxine, if you want to go ahead and unmute. As it is written, do I not fill heaven and earth? A beautiful quote of, of, of both filling uh, the physical and the spiritual worlds. So that's the first part of the meditation is however you relate to it, filling your mind with the concept of the greatness of the Ain Sof. We can't really grasp even a piece of the Ain Sof, but we have a mind that can that can meditate upon that concept, that the infinite light is infinite, that it, that it creates the entire world, it fills the world, it surrounds the world, and has authority over the entire world. And that already is starting to fill myself with a sense of dread as I'm saying it. But now there's part two of the meditation, which says basically, not only is the Ain't Self so great, but the Ain't Self itself wants to have an individual relationship with me and wants me to accept that authority. It's very interesting. In Judaism, you know, we hear the word king, and it's another word that people... Uh, you know, they get, they get a little uneasy with because we don't, we don't have kings anymore and we don't relate to it. And in fact, there's a mashpia. There was a, a, a sort of a, a community teacher who, uh, in 1917 in Russia, when when the czar, the last czar was killed and the Bolshevik Revolution took place, you know, they didn't know quite what was in what, what they were in store for. But he said, you know, the the pity is now there's not a representative, there's not an example of malchus on the earth. There's not there's not a there's not a good metaphor for me to say to students when they say. Well, what, what do you mean I should have Yura of, of the Ain't Self? What, what does that mean? Until now, I could just say, well, imagine you're having lunch with the Tsar, right? And every one of those Jews would say, oh, <laughs> okay, I get it. The Tsar, right? Total authority, total greatness. You know, just, you just stay, stay in your seat and, you know. And I'll admit, Alex, there's a little bit of the, the fear of a bear in that one, too. But, uh, uh, you know, he said... Tsars weren't always so lovable. Exactly, Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, he said, you know, it's, it's, it's too bad there's not a representative of what a, a king really is on earth, because he saw that in the future, there'd be Jews like us who'd say, what, what do you mean, have Yira of God? What's this business with the king? Like, we elect our leaders, they shake our hands, right? What's interesting is, in Judaism, a king needs to be accepted by the people. The people have to accept the malchus, the rulership of the king, or they're not a king. There's no such thing as a dictator in Judaism, you can install a dictator that can force their kingship on the people, but that's not called a melech. So every one of the Jewish kings was accepted by the Jewish people. That actually is part of the definition of a king. So it's a little closer to a democratically elected leader than you think, because every year in Rosh Hashanah, we get up and we blow the shofar and we say, God, please put your malchut on us, be king over us, and we accept your kingship again. And if we don't do that, then God's actually missing something, believe it or not. God needs us to do that. So we sort of have an annual election where we elect God to be king over us again, and that is part of the equation. God needs that. Let's. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to pick that up next time we uh, we start again. So we're gonna start on part two of the meditation. But let's actually do a bit of meditation, so we're not. Uh, so this is not an academic uh, exercise. So if you're with us, a very simple technique I'm gonna share with you. And thanks for joining us. You want to find yourself in a comfortable position. This will take just a few minutes. Nice long spine. I'm going to relax my face. 
and eyelids smooth and relaxed. Shoulders falling heavily away from my spine. And start to deepen your breathing just naturally. If you can, breathe through your nose rather than your mouth if that's available. Now, if you've worked with us, you know there's four stages to breath, and we're going to even out those four stages. So we'll count four counts for the breath in, four counts to hold the breath in, four counts to release the breath out, four counts to hold the breath out. So we'll extend each of those four aspects of the breath so they're even with each other. Together with me, breathing in, two, three, four, stay there, two, three, Four, breathing out, two, three, four, stay empty, two, three, repeat again with me in, two, three, four, together there, two, three, breathing back out, two, three, four, and stay there, and start the Pat on your own, keeping the four counts for each step. You can add your belly into the picture, so your belly is out when you breathe in, and then as you breathe out, pulls back up towards your diaphragm. All kinds of health benefits, mental benefits, to just this simple breathing. The nervous system is opening up calming down, integrating with everything about you. Now we're going to move to the spiritual. We're going to open up a wisdom gateway. This is where we become focused on mindfulness. We're going to open up our wisdom gateway, and the gateway is the pause between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. There's a space that is between the end of your in-breath and the beginning of your out-breath. That will be our gateway for wisdom. Let that open naturally, beautifully, as you continue the breathing cycle. If you're watching this in the future, feel free to pause at any of these stages so you can allow perhaps a minute or two to establish the wisdom gateway. And then we're going to place a divine concept in the wisdom gateway. Picturing the beginning of this meditation, how God is filling the world, surrounding the world, has authority over the entire world, and yet God is paying attention to me and my actions right now. Let that divine concept fill your mind in all the details that occur. And as that's filling your mind, if, if, if you're seeing it on a small screen, perhaps expand the screen three or four times. If you're seeing the image in black and white, add some bright colors. And if the image is separate from you, perhaps integrate yourself into the image. Find to add sound, let it fill your mind, fill your whole inner vision, inner hearing. And just see if there's anything on the Yura side of your consciousness that's being inspired by this meditation. That an infinite light, an infinite God, is paying direct attention to me. If you're not in class, feel free to pause this video and remain in this meditation for 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you are... Where our class is done, so let's open our eyes, wiggle our fingers. Thank you for joining us on Facebook. This is User's Guide for the Soul. We'd love to have you in person. So uh, just let Maya at temple-israel.org know if uh, you'd like the link to the Zoom. I'm going to sign off on Facebook, and uh, we'll continue our conversation here in the class for anyone that can hang out.